Twist of the knife, a turn of the screws, it's all in your mind, and it's fighting you on yourself. The storm is coming. Well, kid, what you gonna do now? It's your reflection looking out to pull you down. So, are you gonna die today? Swallow the pride, turning the tide to true believers. Got them in the form of your hand, you're playing. What you gonna do now? It's your reflection, looking back to pull you down. So are you gonna die?
Fun plus Phoenix et G2 Esports. Que la finale des championnats du monde 2019 de League of Legends commence. Europe has reached further and further. We've been getting closer and closer to actually winning worlds. The tides are and to finally get the actual win on the board in front of the European crowds, that would be the dream. Not only do they get to the final, they knock out the defending world champions. By judgment, this one is LWX, he snaps his fingers and half the LPL teams left at world disappear. People thought this would be the return of SKT, but we shut them down and now we want to make our own empire. The greatest team in the history of League of Legends taken down by the greatest team Europe has ever produced. FPX, get ready. G2 is heading to Paris. In last year we had Europe against China finals as well, but I feel like this year is different. I feel like we as Europe are way stronger. G2 is stronger. Five creative players who are all on the same page. You're not going to get another combination like this put together. This G2 Esports team was not built to win. It was built to conquer. When you look at FPX, this is brother than ours. This is like, no man is left behind. A team that is greater than the sum of its parts. I think LEC and LPL are the most important thing. 打架打得会比较多，但是感觉LPL的个人能力应该要更强一点。如果我们S9这次拿了冠军的话，S8和S9我们LPL连续拿了两次冠军，那这代表我们是第一赛区。He will manage to hit the cocoon. So huge that they get that kill. He's incredibly fast. Flash out, not enough. Cap sees it coming, takes him out. Woo! Someone gets hooked, someone is dead. Tiki coming from behind. He has assassinated Jackie Love. Perks is coming in. This is his hero moment if he wants to turn this fight. It's not just about me winning worlds, it's not just about G2 winning worlds, but it's about us winning worlds. It's Europe's time. Clash of Regions, and only one can stand at the end of it all. Thank you again to all of the artists up there on that stage and MasterCard for another killer opening ceremony. How do they keep doing this? Every time, every, every time. Every time. And I can't help but get emotional, because last year, when I had the opportunity to see Fnatic on that world final stage, I thought that this was a one-off. But we're seeing it again. And now, no one can say that Europe doesn't produce this level of talent. There are players at home right now that are looking at 
this opening ceremony. They're seeing those European players and they're believing that they can do it too. Couldn't have said it better myself. So now there's nothing left to do but narrow in on this series. Let's get into all of those little bits that might sway it one way or another. That might allow Europe, Europe to walk away with their very first world title. I want to know what you think ultimately will tip the scales in this series. Jack, I'm coming to you first. So there's a lot of things that could tip it, but one thing that I feel like will be more influential than others is the draft, but more so how it plays out in game. Because we know that Doinby is going to have slightly different picks than we're used to. It could be Rumble Mid, it could be Nautilus. How do you deal with banning out the meta champions and letting him have those, or countering his pocket picks? And I think that's what'll do it, is how will Caps counter the stuff that Doinby pulls out? Because if he's unsuccessful, it could be a series for FPX. When it comes to trying to control Doinby, it's not a matter of if you can do it, it's for how long can you do it? Because he will eventually unlock himself, but I agree with you, Jet. The draft is so crucial because teams have to pick their poison. Do they try to narrow Doinby's champion pool because you just can't deal with how weird these picks are? You don't want to face it in the lane? Or do you try to pinch in other positions? Do you look at trying to abuse a support pool or a jungle pool? And that's why Doinby, yes, he's the shot caller, but he's also just kind of the heart and soul of the team because he tanks so much for them in draft. And Vedias, we didn't get to talk about this in the semifinal, but how many draft bucks do you decide to use on the big champions? Like, do you want to spend two draft buck bills on Rise, or do you have to spend all of them? Because that's, that's what a question. lot of these drafts well, uh, how much end does up coming it cost? down to. <laughs> you must have a price. I was going to say, those are well, looking less well, like draft I, bucks I, and more <laughs> like jat bucks. I did not first make of these. All. Someone made these for oh, right. Would you, 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 would you, would you <laughs> kindly tell me what the exchange rate of a of a draft buck is to maybe the Euro? Two shroot bucks to one jat buck. Two shroot bucks to one jat buck. Listen, when it comes to this draft here against Doing B, I think, yes, you can remove maybe the Nautilus. Take away the one. But you can't spend all your bans on him because there's so many yeah. other key picks for this team. Tian hard carried on Kiana in that semifinal. You have to respect these kind of things. And I think, as you highlighted there, what does Caps pick? That's the important thing. If you find a pick for G2 where you can constantly keep doing being check, then you win the series. I do want to put a quick point on that Nautilus pick because I agree with you. I hope yeah. that they pinch the Nautilus just because then Chris has shown that he either goes Nautilus or he goes Kench. And one of the greatest oh. answers about the Kench is the pike, and that's what I want to see. I want to see a baited Varus Kench, and then G2 just start dunking with the pike. And I'm happy that you mentioned that, Frost, because, Jet, I love that you're talking about how can they control Doinby's champion pool. Wonder played Yorick. We have Orianna in the bot lane. Uh -huh. How can you control the creativity that G2 brings? Let's not forget that it was Pike that shut down SKT at the MSI semifinals. This team is full of creativity and flexibility. And while so many people are looking at the mid lane, you've got to look at this whole G2 roster and question, what have they come prepared with today? See that guy? See grabs looking all inconspicuous? That guy's a killer. Like, <laughs> his drafts are wild. Some live shots of G2 backstage as they get ready. But uh, it, it appears all confidence as they're not necessarily running over any last minute game plans. They're just getting in the zone. Oh, yeah, you, and ready you have to your go. prep ready now. <laughs> I found it very interesting earlier, Jat, when you had said in looking at that 99 champion presence statistic yeah. that you believe if we're to hit 100, it will actually come from the G2 camp in response to these doing B picks. Just look at Caps' history. Kane mid, yep. Vayne mid. Please no Kane mid, but everything in that you can imagine mid. So who better to know something strange that could beat Nautilus mid? The champions that aren't normally mid lane have unexplored counter picks, and Caps has the brain to figure out what those are. But let's also remember, you don't have to counter the weird picks specifically in a 1v1. You can just pick something super strong for yourself and your team that can actually do somewhat the same, and then maybe late game, you become the main carry. Nautilus never becomes the main carry late. Caps can do that on some of his champions. His Syndra in team fights against SKT was perfect in the end. You saw the team fight breakdown of that fight where he's just dancing around, catching people out. These kind of picks can go in G2's favor the later we go into the game. I don't know, Chad, did you see that team fight breakdown? I'm not sure. If I, not, I you should I go back and watch that. It was, uh, it was wonderful. <laughs> uh, that's what Jat was looking at specifically in the series. But Frosk, I want to come to you next. So I think as you kind of go pound for pound talent-wise, it can kind of go back and forth. We just talked about how draft is important, how it'll come down to execution. For me, the one place that I don't think there is any argument that it is just definitive is actually in the ADC position. I think that perks will 
will be the difference maker today. I think if it goes the distance, if it comes down to the clutch moments, Perks is the better ADC when it comes down to LWX. FPX like to rely on kind of traditional 5v5, traditional team fights. They can play front to back, but this guy will bring things like the Syndra, the Orianna, the Yasuo. He can mix it up in draft. And I think that he is the more consistent, higher performing member if they do go to the 5v5 late game. And at the start of the year, when he just roll swapped, people had a lot of questions about his marksman specifically. The mages we knew he could play 100%, but how good would he be on a late game AD carry when there are four players on the other side who's diving at you specifically? One misstep, you're dead, you might lose the fight for your team. He has shown during this year he's gotten better and better and better. And in that semi-final, people talking about Teddy, you know, he's gonna be a better late game team fighter. No, he wasn't. Perks was able in those late game team fights to win it for his team on Yasuo or on traditional AD carry. So I think he can do everything right now. And that's why I agree with Frost. He's the better player. Perks is the best Zaya in the world. Don't even at me. Don't disagree with me. That is how it is. Leave Zaya up. I dare you. I think that's the consensus. I don't think Perks gets Zaya this series. So what I'm going to be interested in as far as Perks is, is he the best Kaisa in the world? Is he the best... Ezreal in the world, right? Like, because really, it's G2 has so many draft threats that Perks has been able to get Sai almost every time. But if that gets attacked, yes, he's a mid laner. Yes, he should have a big champion pool. But the active practice champion pool, he has looked best on Zai and Kaisa. After that, his mages haven't looked that good this World Championship. But how about that Yasuo? <laughs> if all else fails, we time. go back to the Quadra Kill Yasuo, six yeah? power spike. <laughs> Perks is very familiar Let's with go. it. Let's <laughs> go! That's what I like to see. Well, Deficio, we got a little bit of a focus on the bot lane, AD Carry specifically. What about you, focusing on the same lane? Well, yeah, I'm looking at the supports. I think both supports are huge playmakers. I think the way the game is played right now, the optimal way to play the game is having active supports who are able to either set up a play in their own lane when multiple people are coming down, or able to leave the lane at the right times and go especially towards the mid lane. We will see it from both teams. And I think Chris and Mickey, they've ended up being superstar players in this role, especially Chris. He's been the best performing support all tournament. So I'm looking at that matchup specifically because these two, two, two guys will be involved in everything. I mean, that's very nice and you've all contributed a lot. Let's, <laughs> let's actually talk about okay. what the Whoa. actual okay. win condition will be all right, because we me. have to look at the early game. I believe that both of these teams know Know what to do with a lead. Domestically, this is what they were famous for, taking a 1k gold lead and ballooning it into a 5k gold lead in the space of five minutes. If either of these teams is able to even find a tiny advantage in the early game, I am confident that it will be fast, it will be efficient, and it will be deadly. Uh, well, so uh, FBX demonstrated a clear ability to do that against IG in their semi-final, but it was a bit rougher of a go for G2. Yeah, that's the thing. That series ended up being more about late game for G2 because they didn't win early game. That's why we gave it to FBX as well in the scorecard. They came back late game team fights, used that come very well. There is a chance this game will go towards that. Who has the best late game team fighting? I do think that though that those stats are a little bit skewed towards FBX. Yes, it is kind of their bread and butter anyway, but ultimately they went through the group of life. They had a much easier side of the bracket. They faced an opponent in IG that they were very familiar with. Defending world champions though. I don't think they were defending world champion form, but yes. Well, as you can tell by the images on your screen and the cheers from around this stadium, the players have made their way to the stage. So it is that time, my favorite time, where we reveal what my analysts believe will be the world champion here in 2019. So let's throw it up on the screens. Who do you believe is walking away with the title of 2019 world champion? This is an incredibly difficult prediction. I feel like these teams are very evenly matched. You can look over at the LPL broadcast, you'll see a lot of FPX predictions. You can look here, and I think we're gonna see a lot of G2 predictions because they do play similar ways. They have had different strength of schedules. It's gonna be about who performs slightly better on the day. What? Oh, 4G2. We got 4G2. Okay. All right, explain yourselves. Why so much confidence? I mean, I believe that G2 is the better version of FPX. I believe that their styles are very similar. And even though G2 did not showcase a strong early game, you only have to look at their Dom 1 series to recognize what they're capable of. They have way more flexibility in draft. They have the individual pound for pound stronger talent. And I believe that they should be able to come out on top against FPX in convincing fashion. I want to jump straight to what he just said here about individually the talent is better, especially in the carry positions. In a world 
final in this kind of arena, what you need are clutch players, especially in those key carry positions. Late game team fighting, all of the G2 members can find the right target and pull the trigger. That last team fight against SKT were multiple fights happening with all five players having to perform at the highest level. That's why I think in the end, G2 will take it and it will go all the way to five, but they are just a better team. It's, it's very close and G2 has taught me a lot throughout this world championship. You need to be flexible, you need to make split second decisions and you need to be risk tolerant. Okay. When I find myself on a desk with three European casters predicting G2, I have a flex prediction. This is the case for it, and it's flexing to an FPX 3-1. The risk is high, whoa, but the reward, whoa, whoa. the reward of being the only person to call the correct world champion would be very high. Jat and since this is a toss-up, I'm leaning into flex picks and being risk tolerant. Jat pulled a G2. Let's uh, do in, it. In G2 territory, <laughs> how many the response? Bucks does this cost? Yeah, how many bucks did that cost you? Uh, yeah. All the draft bucks. It's just draft bucks. All right, yeah. there you go. But, but what I was just going to say is that like, while we've talked about you know harder side of bracket, weaker side of the bracket, everything like that. The fact of the matter is, is that G2 went through the three Korean teams to get here. Griffin, Dan won at SKT. But frankly, history has shown us that Korea is no longer the strongest region. That title actually belongs to the LPL right now. G2 have an opportunity to take it away, but they haven't beaten a Chinese team yet. This is the true test. Who really is the strongest region in the world? And I think that is kind of the, the bigger storyline overshadowing this. Are you really better than China? Or are you simply third place with the LCK? Well, this year, this G2 roster has not lost a best of five. And I see no reason for them to start today. No reason. All right, well, let me throw something out there. We got a little bit more time. So I'm going to try and poke a few. Ho no, we don't have more time. <laughs> as soon as I do that, I'm told the teams are ready. So it's time to kick off the 2019 World Final. Let's hand it over to Quick Shot, Kobe, and Papa Smithy for game one. Thank you so much to the analyst desk and welcome to the caster desk. We are moments away from game one of the World Championship final. And I'm gonna pick it up with Vedia set it off. G2 Esports are one best of five victory away. An accomplishment that neither RNG nor SKT were able to do. And this crowd is literally deafening and they want to see it happen. It is amazing in here, Quick Shot. This is my favorite feeling in the world, passion. And this arena is overflowing right now. When I heard that the world final will be in Paris after experiencing this crowd last year at MSI, I had goosebumps at the idea of having a world final here. The reality, it's matching. So let's turn our attention to draft. I can see the players starting to filter into the lobby. Let's talk about some of the the picks that we want to see, the analyst desk has spent a long time talking about the styles of these teams, which we'll expand on. But what are the unique picks that we want to see? I believe FPX had side selection and picked blue, if I recall correctly. And there are a couple of differences the analyst desk was alluding to is different values placed on some of the key champions for both of these teams, right? If you take the Zaya, for example, LWX performance would indicate a lower preference for this champion as well as lower proficiency. Meanwhile, the Kiana is a similar counterpart if you're looking at from G2's side because of Yankos' performances. Although it's still a flex pick and Caps can perform on it in the mid lane. And you have to wonder, first question I have, First pick on blue side, because I actually expect both teams to pick blue side the entire series through. Yeah. Rise with the Gragas Yasuo combo. These are things that are going to be either prized or picked away. Well, we're into draft, everybody, and straight out of the gate. Fun plus Phoenix have eliminated Syndra immediately following with Pantheon. And that will surprise some people, but we know that Caps is a strong Syndra player, and it's a champion that bullies melee mid laners with big CC totals. So I don't hate the ban at all. And there's a Gragas ban here, so no red side Gragas Yasuo first round available for G2. Yeah, FPX banning some of the key flexible picks here. As everybody knows, the bottom laner for G2 used to be a mid laner, perks also can play the Syndra, and Gragas right now, S-tier jungler, but also, as you talk about, great synergies in setting up champions like Yasuo. But this is a bit of a wild card, a Kai'Sa ban here, even though it is a premier pick. I guess they don't want to first pick it, but don't want to hand it over to Perks either. The Zaya priority for Fun Plus Phoenix is lower than most teams. It'll draw a ban, notably, Doonby's famous rise is available. 
And that should be a lock-in because this is such a powerful pick in the current meta. It's flexible in both lane setup as well as later on into the game. However, they're gonna prize the flex Nautilus over it. The bread and butter champion, mid lane Nautilus, is synonymous with Do and Me and Fun Plus Phoenix. And we should get into why it is for a lot of viewers that haven't grown accustomed to FPX's style yet. Doombi is much more about pushing the wave and shoving into finding picks or team fights for his team. And he uses the utility of Nautilus, especially the low cooldown on the ultimate to force summoner spells elsewhere and open up areas of the map for his team to target. And Varus Tom Kench, priority with Kaisa and Zaya gone, surely is higher than ever. Now, we haven't seen it married to the Tom Kench every time, but it's something that's definitely to consider. That rise doesn't look like it's going to be left available for FPX to pick up. And I like your point on the Tom Kench, because you always look in the pick and ban phase to shore up the weaknesses of your earlier picks with your later picks. Tom Kench, very unique support, provides a disengage for Varus, which is a very offensive carry here, doesn't have any mobility for himself, but does allow G2 crowd control and set up towards the bottom half of the map. And here we go, Sivir actually being locked in, very much been a peripheral AD carry over the course of summer 2019. Another team fighting choice, though, and the utility to help the Nautilus close the gap. And two major strengths of Sivir. The spell shield to deny that possible CC and set up in the bottom lane we just talked about, as well as Sivir's renowned wave clear. We can see if FPX can actually try and control bottom lane waves in order to open up 30-second windows for both Chris to roam as well as Doombi. Now, here's a small question I want to put out there. Is that actually Chris most played support over in the LPL was the Lux pick, as Lux support was a big champion. In Korea, we talked about how Lux papered over the weaknesses in early laning phase of a Sivir and actually made it a lane dominant duo. Hit a binding, then you're gonna hit a boomerang, and you're gonna get big burst damage totals here. It'd be a surprise to see it brought back, and yet it's a consideration because not quite the same pike proficiency as our G2 brethren. I'm excited to see where it lands, and obviously with that Nautilus expected to go in doing these hands, the G2 first ban is that Blitzcrank as well as the Braum. So G2 thinking along the same lines. Funplex Phoenix are starting to remove some of those junglers from the pool. Gragas, Rek'Sai, Lee Sin's picked away. Elise is still available, and one of Yankos' go-to picks with Olaf removed from the pool. Let's see where he lands, Kobe. And the reason that you can see Fun Plus Phoenix trying to funnel them into that pick is because they want heavy AP. Because Ryze was early picked, they're banning away two AD junglers, the Rek'Sai and the Olaf, even though, as you're mentioning, Quickshot, Elise is higher on the tier list four junglers. It being AP weakens your top side of the map then because only the solo laners and the jungler have one damage type. And G2 were basically on a bound to take jungle at pick here, not just because red side counter pick, but because Ryze beats GP, and that's Kim Goon's signature champion. So it's a great top lane matchup, and they potentially have a fiery double counter pick scenario going on. And now for G2, seeing this gangplank, I would predict an attack damage champion looking to kill the gangplank early. No, Give me a name. Things like the Kled can pair with Elise to go for those dives. You know, Kled, if you get shot, it will take you off of the mount. You can reset and dive very easily with Elise, who can also reset. And of course, the gang plank are locked in with that thresh. A very quick hover on the Nocturne from Mickey. This is a brief shout out, not only to Doom B, who's played at mid, to Vedius, who was also trying to persuade them that Nocturne was the way to go. We are looking for that solo lane pick in the top. Okay! Lane. Okay! Now, now, this pike could go mid, could go top, hell, it could go anywhere. G2 is one of the unique teams in that every single player has played pike. Even the jungler, Kobe, and this is a champion pick that will be reverberated around the world. Paris losing their minds. And I said attack damage, Papa Smith. Uh, you're right. That is attack damage for you. Looks like at the last second, you have to wait till 20 seconds, actually, for the last swap to come through. But it could be either of the solo laners here. Expecting it to be a top, a mid lane choice as Ryze beats Gangplank. Waiting for it. We get the confirmation. Will be Pike mid lane against Nautilus. Final plus Phoenix versus G2 Esports. The team compositions are locked in. Caps is running it in the mid lane. In game number one. 
now. We have to go over some of the unique things about Pike because it was even nerfed since G2 last used it in a prolific manner among all these lanes. The AoE is much less so. This Pike is not about winning lane, by the way. This is about the roam game. Caps and Doombi setting up teammates, sharing gold, and creating plays. And the crazy thing is, even though it's been dominant, the Nautilus is too. some differences in decision making in game and we'll get a moment to discuss how each of these teams styles has been demonstrated at Worlds and how they want to win this opening game. And style Trevor is a key word. I am so excited to see that both teams that have made it to the top of the world competition here have embraced the avant-garde. Both of these mid laners, heavy roamers. We've had Caps, highest percentage among all mid laners from roaming away mid lane. Mickey, highest percentage roaming away from the bottom lane partner. Doombi on these champions that push and roam to create plays for the rest of the team. Now, even as you can see in game, this is a predator pike to further enhance this style and this quick speed that we've become accustomed to in the current state of pro play. Because the 3v3 is what we so often come to when we talk about Fun Plus Phoenix. We talk about how the support and the jungle will often roam mid to help and to aid this high CC mid lane champion, usually Rise or Nautilus in terms of the world championship. And from there, if the Nautilus has first roam, they're going bot lane, getting LWX an advantage. G2 were aware of this. We knew what FBX would play. Amazingly, this aggressive team that took the world by storm at MSI, G2 is now very much the chameleon that looks at what the yep. enemy's tendencies are and tries to counter it. We saw from their first game at Worlds, they fought Griffin, they went scaling, and they outscaled a great team fighting team in Griffin. And it's one of the reasons the analyst disc was leaning towards G2 to win this series, the ability to adapt your play style. Now, I'm getting an update that the pause is on G2's side. Wonder reports it a peripheral issue which league officials are investigating and working with him. I'm not sure if you noticed, it's the same stage where the opening ceremony took part. They physically had to move everything back on stage. <laughs> so hopefully we can work our way through this. But I am glad that we get a couple of extra minutes to set some expectations for fans and viewers at home. As we've alluded to on that Fun Plus side, we even saw the gangplank you guys jokingly off air said to me, once Doombi pushes mid, he'll roam bot and maybe if Gimgoon's lucky, he'll throw a cannon barrage. Yep. That's literally what we can see come true. And I then want to see what G2's answer is, because if we know it, they know it. And that's the thing is they've actually left open almost all the strong tendency champions that FBX have gone to. This is very much a bread and butter draft for FBX and you think about the mind game here because they knew what was coming, they opted into it anyway and suddenly the ban flexibility guys, the ban flexibility you get if you beat their best is that suddenly they're boxing with shadows and you're second to every draft as FBX. And this really highlights that there is another game on top of game number one in best of five series and that is the draft game. You're playing for mental edge if you are able to beat the key style of the opponents it forces them to reach outside their comfort zone and play less tested opportunities. And of course, we're very focused on the gameplay aspects of it. Imagine sitting on oh, that yeah. stage in these tens of thousands of fans, listening to the cheers, and obviously it is G2 favored. It is both a blessing and a curse. And Fun Plus, they said it uh, uh, in Madrid. They wanted to make Paris cheer their name. And we'll see if they can do it today. And the resilience factor is something that I think both teams are associated with, but G2 especially. They've had all those five game series with Fnatic, domestically, of course. And I definitely agree with all their experience. They do have a resilience edge. 
but how much of, does, of that does it transfer to a world final? Because they've been in big stadiums before in Europe, but the world final is a unique beast, and there's a reason why so many world finals have been three zeros. Kobe, you and I were there last year. We remember <laughs> what they're like. We definitely do, and you can feel the excitement building up in this crowd. Trevor, you mentioned something before about being glad that we have some extra time now because you're not going to get it in game. No. Coming to Worlds, these two teams were both first place in summer for the respective leads in combined kills per minute, in gold leads at 15 minutes. The early game is expected to be action heavy for both of them. I mean, G2's average game time was something like 26 to 28 minutes, the shortest, I believe, worldwide, at least in the major regions. They play one style. That's why their snowballing stats of this is how much lead they have, and then five minutes later they tripled it, is just the G2 way. A G2 victory always happens even faster than you can really process it as the enemy team. And of course, when you look at the team composition that they've drafted today, gentlemen, if they were win more buttons, I think a Realm Warp, as well as everything in Pike's kit, is definitely the tools to do so. So, who on the team would get a Pike skin? What if they did five Pike skins for G2, and all was a little bit different? Well, if I recall correctly, <laughs> during the build-up in the press conference, FPX said they were asked a question, what skins would you want? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And FPX ran through, I believe Chris <laughs> said, I would pick Pike, because I know G2 love it, and I want to take it away from them. And I love the banter that both of these teams are willing to throw down in building anticipation for this match. Speaking of a takeaway, can we collude and get Yankos a Brahm skin over it? <laughs> I think that, that would be the cherry on top. <laughs> Obviously, for a lot of European viewers, if you follow G2 on their social media, seeing Tom Kench picked in is a meme. This team is not a huge fan of the particular champion. It doesn't quite fit their flair, shall I say. I mean, there's been beef between their coach and support, right, exactly. about actually playing the pick. I think the LPL have shown what this pick is. It's no longer the save button that we saw the LCK teams for years persist in doing. I think that the Prey Gorilla days and the perennial Tom Kench picks is very much a, wow, resetting turret aggro when you're diving is a pretty good aggressive use of the Tom Kench. And you mentioned the Realm Warp. They've got an Abyssal Voyage too. Yep. And then Predator Pike shows up. And is there a bigger win more button in the mid game than a over-leveled Pike giving gold to his allies? And of course, let's turn our attention to FPX a little bit. As you can still see League officials working with Wonder on the G2 side. I do apologize about the delay before we get into this opening match, but the Nautilus, the Sivir, the Gangplank, there is AOE for days on this side of the Rift, as well as real strong CC and initiate. And since we have the time, I'd like to go a bit deeper on the strategy behind both of these team comps, right? If you have the lens like Trevor's talking about on FPX's side, they have more limited options in the early game. Uh, because of the matchup in top lane where Gangplank has to play defensively uh, versus the Rise past a couple of levels here, it is going to be a lot about where these junglers decide to unlock their lanes and get the roaming down. Because Sivir and Thresh, especially a Sivir uh, taking TP here, is much more about wave control and about setting it up uh, than being a creationary tool here. So if Tien can get Doinbi control of the mid wave against the Pike, who we talked about not having the AoE as before, that unlocks you to actually be proactive. Otherwise, we're looking at the G2 side with more proactive options early on. And I love that you're going on the matchup because that's what you usually do when you have this overlay up, Rise beats GP, yep, Varus Tom against Sivir, yep. Imagine considering the organic Pike versus Nautilus mid lane <laughs> trend. That is what we have to talk about. That is normally the mid lane matchup, but both of them to some degree are set up champions, but kind of in different ways. And I, I love the differences because with your E on Nautilus, the big advantage it has is shove. Nautilus can shove the minion wave. So. So many, so many people looking at champions here, but most people should be looking at minions because minions is the first step to actually creating these plays. I believe Cap spends the most time out of lane of any mid laner, and you don't have the ability to push with your E anymore. You have no AOE really on the kid at all. So it's going to be who dodges out those minion waves and actually gets successful roams off. Because 
at this point, he's going to be down in CS one way or the other. It's going to be really about the playmaking that I think we judge both mid laners on. And the beautiful thing is both of these teams have demonstrated multiple times this World Championship that they are capable of doing so. Just an update for everybody at home that after getting onto the Rift, G2 Wonder paused the game, reporting that peripheral issue. His keyboard was not responding, and after installing his backup keyboard, the issue is resolved. We are back on Summoner's Rift for the 2019 World Final. Kobe and Papa Smithy, thank you so much for setting up those expectations on both team comps. Papa, can I ask for a quick refresher? Because it was about five minutes ago that we last heard it from the team. Absolutely. With FPX, it is very much a mid to late game team fight comp, but it's at the price of early laning phase. I think there's a lot of inroads that can be made in top and bot lane here for G2. As King Goon finds Wonder, Tian backing him up. Okay, Sonic Wave will find him down. Flash is available. He's not going to be able to get away just yet. They're not needed. And it should take some damage. Looking at the minimap, no responses yet. Now, it's incredibly important to look at the aftermath of this invade. It is a split map here. FPX trying to invade on the top side and take away red buff here. G2 doing the same on bottom side. Defensive vision has been in place. It's very often that we'll see FPX go for these lane splitting strategies at the cost of their bot lane, but with Civit Thresh, you weren't expecting lane dominance anyway. So they seem to be wanting to give breathing room to the gangplank. Ryze can't take aggressive trades with no jungle atop side. It's exactly as we mentioned in Champion Select. The gangplank is very vulnerable to dives early on. Ryze can use the range advantage and go for that. But bottom side of the map, FPX are trying to defend against the even split map. Usually you'll have red traded for red side, but Crisp denies the Krug camp, the one with the most experience and gold on it in the entire map. Actually in the G2 Griffin series and groups saw how a delay in snow is that this can have huge cascading effects on lanes as the jungler isn't there at level three at the same time. Back in bot lane, LWX and Chris just being super respectful. As Doin B's already walking. While they're being respectful in game, Perks was not too respectful out of game. Doin B won't even be the second best mid in the final. Carlos reiterated that, but if you look at the minimap, Doin B has already roamed very early on. I'm looking at the minions, Kobe, and Wonder's still under pressure. Tian's one nearby, but Doin B's gone back to lane. It's really worth highlighting how top laners play when they do not have pressure, when their jungler is the opposite side of the map. Wanda, he didn't go forward for the chase. Tian is still nearby. And it's highlighted because Wonder knows that this is a split map and it's a possible dive being set up. Also, as you can see on the minimap, Dorin B has started to move. All right, Tian has pulled the wave. He's got himself the red buff. There's the overload. Teleport starting to come in. This is a three versus one. Wanda's got mana. He's got flash, but it's a reply already. There's the root down. Wanda gives up first blood to FBX. Caps gets a stun under the tower. Dorin B still doesn't go down. Now Caps is in trouble. Fun plus Phoenix are looking for the double. Caps is trying to swim to safety. Teleport begins to channel in the top lane. Wonder joins, but FPX are on the ball. And two things to look in the aftermath. The teleport's both used there, but the big minion wave also forces Wonder to teleport back. You can see Caps actually now rotating around for a possible answer here. Looking to interrupt it back if he can, but for now it will be a blue buff steal. A potential three buff here for Yang. I really want to highlight how Doon B had started to roam up and walk his way there, but because they needed the extra second, starts teleporting on the minion under tower, even though he had made it halfway up the map. As you can see now, he's almost there already, but they know that because Caps is going to answer, they need the extra second, flashes in, then you can have the W from Tian to guarantee the execute damage there. Just really nicely coordinated, coordinated here by FPX. But a very extended setup. That's the FPX way. They don't mind to surround you, put up the spears and say, you're in trouble, just give me a second to fully set this up. G2 are usually more instant about their plays, but this time, wasn't in position the Elise to punish, it's to the profit of an extra blue buff. All right, Caps takes a little bit of damage and doing be the first one to move. Now Wanda flash the Sonic Wave, it's a resonating strike, he's trying to escape, he's going down! Yankos arrives, it's too little, it's too late, and the top difference from pressure is fantastic for FPA. And it's a different look, they haven't gone mid lane to try to work with the Nautilus, it's been Tian setting up a camp, he's back again. He absolutely is, remember we said FPX are great at diving bot, now they're showing us they're great at diving top! Yankos is caught out and he's gonna get squashed, like 
like a bug underneath FBX's boot because what goes up must come down, but the flash gets him to safety. Yankos with the quick fingers. I was convinced he was dead, and he survives for now. And look at the pace that FPX are setting here. They're not letting G2 reset from the loss of pressure that they have accrued on top side. They keep chaining play after play into G2's weakness. This is something that both of these teams have been so good at. Once they get an early lead, and FPX mining that top side advantage so heavily. And it means that the kill involvements for GP puts them in basically parity, maybe a small lead over the rise here. Trades are still going to be very one-sided to wonder, but it's definitely been a lot of top lane focus from the split map level one on the side of FBX. I like the attitude from FBX. They're not trying to defend where they are weak. They are attacking G2 to force them to change their game plan. Wonder is putting so much pressure individually here onto Gimgu, and despite 0-2-0, zero zero, Yankos waiting in the wings as a potential dive. The overload comes out after the room prison as well. That's a lot of minions denied. Plus 10 CS for now, and as it stands, even on levels. Yankos is looking for the cocoon into the bush, and he won't find it. So G2 will be content with pushing back the pressure. They are still down 700 gold, but Papa Smithy, they concede the Drake. So great heads up play from FPX. Both teams kind of ahead of plays here. Good map, root for, map, map read sorry, from Gimgoon. That is definitely his trademark, often playing on the weak side. Hasn't been that way so far this game, but they're reading the change in tempo, the way the wind is blowing. When it comes to the aggression, they'll take the Drake at Chris. Oh, Death Sentence comes down, as does the Boomerang Blade. Mickey's waiting by with the Devourer. Piercing arrow tags. Chris, I'm keeping my eyes on Tian to see if he wants to go under the tower. Flashes available for both bot laners on G2 sides. Yeah, I mean, one of the nerfs to Tom Kench was the, uh, the cooldown on the Devourer there, so it does open up a bigger window early game. Uh, but as you can see, we're highlighting now, back to Champion Select, where we talk about the Varus and Tom Kench synergy you know, shoring up that weakness of the Varus. If you get caught like that, can come through and save a disastrous play. We're still waiting on the FPX standard playbook, which can still be re-entered this game. It's usually boots and mobility first back from lane for Crisp, where we do see that trio mid lane. Might be a duo, because Tian's level six. Exactly, you have to keep tracking the junglers. This game is so much about playing where you have the numbers advantage. And the one that moves first is able to open up that opportunity of chaining across the map. Uh, let's take a look at how they can chain things across the map on the G2 side, because Papa Smithy, if you remember back at MSI, G2 started to fall behind SKT, and it was the Pike mid-game plays that brought them back into it. Right now, Caps is not activated. The first one to leave mid is Doonby. Again, with that superior push, he's come up with the help of Tian, and there's plates being taken down. And we're seeing the exact opposite play here. It is push up through a big minion wave. Seeing that, Wonder backs off. There's a roam up through the jungle from both Doonby as well as Tian. That means G2 no on the bottom side. Yes, they did lose a minion wave on top side, but they're going to try and deny that same minion wave on bottom. And you notice Perks actually has a back timing here rather than trying to cash in plates. So plate gold is certainly not going to be equalized. I actually don't want the minions to push down this plate, otherwise Perks will not get involvement. All the gold goes to the Tom Kench, and he backs now. This game is really highlighting that ebb and flow of pressure. Once again, the flow now on the side of FPX if they have overloaded top side. I was a huge fan of some of the missing pings there from G2, Kobe. You talked about overloading topside. G2 aware of it. Missing pings as Tian was sitting in the tri bush. Doombi could have roamed. Doombi, by the way, plus 15 CS. Moby boots just completed. So I'm expecting more running to the side lane. And that's when you start clicking your fingers. Just you should mention that with the Tia map, Pike can actually push out doesn't just fall into a huge CS hole like it has been so far, about 20 CS and match because the Nautilus having the ability of the earlier roam on the Moby Boots rush means that Predator Pike has actually been caught farming in mid lane a lot. Yeah, this is so exciting to me because we're seeing the, the peak of Fluid League of Legends where it's all in on roaming around. You no, know, first couple of item purchases for Caps do highlight that strategy. Now bottom, will they go for the dive on Perks? There's no Tom Kench. There's no Tom Kench right now. Perks has done some work to clear the minion wave out. I think the piercing arrow did its job. He held on to the hail of arrows. Dredgeline will catch out Mickey. Blast Cone sends to be away. <laughs> now um, all of a sudden, how did Tian go down? I didn't even see it happen. G2 on the ball. FBX disconnected there, trying to make plays in two areas while the Nautilus was taken. Speaking of Nautilus. All right, the cocoon 
Rune lands onto the target. Abyssal Voyage is going to be cancelled. Mickey was looking for the dive. Need to catch a quick glimpse on how Tien was caught on, and so crucially for G2, it's Perks that picks it up. Yeah, beautiful chain of corruption there from Perks to lock him down. That was a big difference in power, too, because it was completed jungle item for Tien, while only pieces for Yankos, and Perks makes a big play for G2. All right, we need to find the cocoon from Yankos. Chris is aware of the situation, and he plays the defensive Thresh more than a screen away, throwing down that lantern to safety. Kim Goon takes a good trade in favor of Wanda. And now all of a sudden, Tian again, present on the map. He has been everywhere this game. Yep, looks like he's headed top again with Doon B here as they push mid and look for another opportunity. Here you go, Trevor, asking you shall receive. Perks able to land the Corrupting Chains right on the Gromp. And then, of course, Caps is there to ensure that they get it. And this is a tendency that I'm sure G2's coaching staff have noted. It is that when they go for these players, when they threaten the dives, they tend to stay around for a long time and check a second time, a third time. They're definitely the sort to check the weather report multiple times before planning an outing. This time caught a little bit there, and that pick does reset some of the good work by FBX. All right, Yankos waiting in the bushes here. Yeah, the gold is just about even 300 the difference. Yankos will get caught up. The cocoon into the tongue lash, but he's caught by the dredge line. Chris goes in with a death sentence. There's the ignite thrown down. Can Mirage comes out as well to do the ultimate. What goes up must go down. There goes Cap. Death from below gets interrupted. That was a fantastic stopwatch. FPX escape. We are going to have some of the best team fights this planet and game has ever seen as both of these teams are trading blow for blow. A lot of tools used by both teams, we have to remember. So very opportunistic for Tian to start up the Rift Herald. That's not going to be a goer for now, and FPX back off. Yeah, that was very close to death for Chris. You mentioned Quick Shot, the stopwatch they had to use, and then immediately he had to flash coming out of it because Perks almost timed a Q from Varus to be able to finish him off afterwards. Now, though, as you're talking about, full resets are coming out. Oh, look at the minimap. One, two, three members, if I count correctly, in the top lane for FPX. G2 Esports are pushing forward. Tian is still snuck in the bush. He's got the Dragon's Rage available. If Perks continues to step forward, and he does, he's caught by the Dragon's Rage. The kick throws him under the tower, and LWX picks up the kill. It's not done yet. Tian goes for the cocoon from Yankos. May have just saved Mickey's life. Doombi continues to change. He dredge lines a little spiraling, and now all of a sudden Caps is waiting in the wings. Level 9 to level 9. Nine. He's going to get spotted out here as he steps forward. Now, all of a sudden, Yankos is the one caught by the Q. Those Spiderlings doing some work for doing B. Bone Skewer pulls him backwards, but I don't think there's enough damage just yet. FPX, a thousand gold up, three kills to one, and they reclaim the lead. Tian here is the highlight. Getting credit here for the brush attempt from him. Chris actually able to land the hook and set the whole thing up. But because Jen is there, he safeguards in. Dragon kick back, getting the kill, and also chasing down the rest of G2 members, thus not letting them get the play on the map. Here we go, they're all headed mid. Oh, very cheeky play from Caps. Waits for the mini wave to go down, but he's already caught up. Flashes away to safety. The Riptide! The Riptide from Durant B! You don't need to see him when you've got AOE. Now Mickey continues to chase forward. Realm Warp from Wanda. Dredge line to safety, but you can't get away from the rise queue. Yankos goes up and goes down. Perks has rejoined the fray. G2 get their second kill of the game, and they will get some chip damage onto this mid outer turret. Keep your eyes on the minimap. Gim Goon is uncontested in the bot lane and pushing forwards. And with Always a jump scare around every corner in this game. Always the backup. The grouping phase started about eight minutes into game number one. Man, the darkness in this game. We don't need a Nocturne for it to be just so scary. You have to consistently move your eyes towards the next objective. Chris right now is setting up the vision game for the setup here on Ocean Drake. FPX are on attack once again. Take a look at the CS differences, by the way. 123 in the mid lane for Doon B. That superior push early has accrued him a 40 CS advantage. G2 will be taking the Rift Herald in the top lane, while another Dragon is secured by FPX in the bottom and Wonder and Caps under some pressure if uh, FPX decides to push. So Herald secured, it's still a thousand gold game, Kobe, and the second Dragon picked up by FPX. I like this move from G2 because they're trying to get the Rift Herald on topside in exchange for the Dragon and get some value out of the extra teleport, but Wonder now stuck under the tower, 1v4. All right, let's see what he can do. Rune prison into Overload gets caught up by the death sentence, and that was just 
flawless from FPX. They pick up an easy kill. They'll be able to pick up the tower, but the tower first blood bonus goes to G2 Esports with the help of the Rift Herald. Keep in mind, it's still a 1,400 gold difference, Papa Smithy. A gold in different corners, but remember, this is a very health, healthy Rift Tower. It could be two turrets here, an advantage that is going to be felt, and a GPO is drawn already. You can see FBX trying to rotate the Sivir into mid lane to hold this wave and allow the rest of the team to push on the minimap. You cannot race with a Rift Herald. Perks is just ushering the Rift Herald straight up to the inhibitor before FBX had even broken the secondary turret. And it's even more big than that. They've been behind this entire game, behind the skirmish, behind the eight ball, and they are losing the turret tempo race. They're getting it slower as this Rift Herald draws a huge, tra uh, huge cheer from the Paris crowd. Paris are loving it. It's five kills to two, but make no mistake, FPX are currently in control. As we now transition into the, the mid-game phase where a lot of skirmishes and, and fights can break out, Kobe, I have to ask, FPX, you said they were a mid to late game team fight team. They have to feel happy with the lead they've generated already. FPX are very happy right now because they have Trinity Force on Gangplank level 11 for the level two ultimate that can come through. So all they have to do is give that Sivir speed boost to the Nautilus Thresh and look for those two hooks onto G2. Now G2 has a harder deal, but they found a pick of their own. Yeah, they absolutely have. That will be secured by perks. Nikki. And arrives just in the nick of time. Now, this will give some pressure into the mid lane. We've talked about the importance of timing, Trevor. Every pick is another 20 seconds of extra pressure, and G2 will use that to try and get half of mid turret, maybe even the full thing. The dredge light doesn't find a target, and Doombeam maybe wants to be happy. Death from below thrown out from a cat, and that's the tower lead now in favor of G2. The gold lead as well, and one simple ward, one simple pick gives G2 control of the mid lane. And that's the thing that G2 have, regardless of gold lead, there's a bone screw is there just to show Doin B that Caps is around, is they have an insane pick come. If they're ever shrouded in darkness, they get those picks and they subvert team fights. Here we go. Yeah, they have to do realm warps coming out, but it interrupted. That's already a kill onto Wonder. LWX threw down the ultimate. Six kills to three. Two dragons up, but the gold is irrelevant right now. Gimgun, however, will equalize the towers. And if you look at the minimap, there's a lot of wards in the northern quadrant in favor of LPA. And look at these two teams going blow for blow. Quick shot, one pick into a turret. Answer here from FPX as soon as they see Wonder in the river. The flash, no hesitation from Crisp to answer it and get the exact same back. Now G2, power play on bottom half. And look, there's just not much gold to separate, even though you'd love it as an FPX fan. It's only about a thousand gold between the two teams we see where it's centered. A lot of that Rift Herald play has reset what was just a growing snowballing lead in terms of map play and also just gold lead from the side of FPX. Now I'm very interested to see how these next five to 10 minutes play out because when G2 Esports fell behind SKT in the semifinals, they found crucial team fights to bring themselves back into the game. I feel like at this tournament, FPX is a different beast and it will be a more difficult challenge for G2. Exactly, you have to play to the champions that your enemy has drafted here. And G2 have a lot to highlight because they've got Rise for side lane, they've got the Predator boots, plus the Ghost Blade for caps. So if they can rotate Varus over to hold the mid lane, then they start to look for those picks to get back into it. But one of the unique things to look for for the fans at home is we don't have wave clear mid laners here. They have teleport, they have hard CC. They don't want to be caught in a side lane at all. So that means we're going to see a lot more fighting as often we'll be playing around one or two lanes maximum rather than the three lane fan out you often see in games like this. And there's a very, very big difference between having your AD carry in mid lane clearing waves with the mid turret and without. Now Cap's going for a play under tower. Oh, oh, takes so much damage when you miss the skill shot. You can't go for those dives. And Caps walks away with his tail between his legs. All right, here we are. A power play on the blue buff side of the map. But there is a ward to scout it out. All right, so FPX have got some sort of a numbers advantage. G2 sniff it out. Look, Volatile Spidling, I think that just spotted out they two did. members of G2. Crisp is now making his way forward. Teleport coming in from Wonder on the tower. The Bone Skewer catches Chris. That's a death from below as G2 will even the goal. But what can they take? They can start up the Drake here and stop the snowballing. G2 are so smart at sussing out these combat puzzles that often games of League of Legends in this meta turn into. The 
moment they got an inkling of there being members on the flank, they took them out as five. And once again, vision will be so important because both of these teams rely on the picks. Chain of corruption will tag do and B. Dredgeline pulls him to safety. The Kaku from Yankos. It will not secure the kill. It will not secure another. It's 20 minutes on the map. This is such a tense game, but G2, they continue trading blow for blow. And I want to highlight what's not on your screen is the mini map. Both side lanes pushing in opposite directions here for G2 as well as FPX. We mentioned these teams have a lot of similar strengths. So while the mid core of both teams are looking for the picks with the Elise, with the Varus there, with the Tom Kench, they are also trying to get the side lane pushing in their advantage to get the extra standing goal. And I love that you pointed out with the arrow there, because the sort of thing that's lost, because people say, oh, it's a death match. Oh, they're just fighting all the time. But it's the setup and the silence that allows it to happen. And speaking of silence oh, setup. Fantastic setup, Papa Smithy. Teleport comes in. If BXF's looking at numbers advantage, Chris will arrive and captures in so much trouble. He's going to get taken out. Oh! oh the Realm Wolf from Wanda! But now they're not done just yet. All of a sudden, the Death Sentence comes out. Ignite goes down. Wanda's running for his life. Tian gets the Sonic Wave, does not follow the Resonating Strike. Cap tries to escape, goes for a swim and does so for now. G2 get up, but FPX's play to set it up managed to avoid defeat. This is definitely a world championship game. Quick shot, so close, the margin of error here. Cap's able to just utilize the full mobility of Pike to get into the edge of the Realm Warp as it was about to disappear. Now it's a reset as they're trying to hold lane, though. Uh, take a look at the minimap there. A lot of members of FPX sitting in the northern quadrant as Caps catches the top lane wave. He sees FPX on top of that control ward, and now G2 looking for a hunt. Baron won't get tagged by the skewer, nor will another champion. And the Volatile Spiling goes wide. Timing is in the favor of FPX because they're the ones that have the split push going for them. They've got Gimgoon on the Gangplank in the bottom lane. You can see on your mini-map. So G2 trying to force them off of Baron, but FPX gaining one extra lane of momentum. And you look at the wards here, you can see the G2 are leaving the vision behind as they fish for picks. We're gonna go to bot lane here. The flash was super necessary because <laughs> the moment this realm warp is on, I didn't think Caps could even get in. Yeah, exactly. Because he got slowed down there, even with the mobility oh. of Pike, barely flashes to the edge. The margin there of error is so incredibly small. One just screaming, I'm helping, I'm <laughs> helping. And Caps manages to make it out. He, by the way, one, one, and three, just sitting on one and a half items for now. But G2 has sneakily picked up a thousand gold lead. I think it's gonna be the least important stat in this game because setup and execution of these team fights, as we have already seen, is what's gonna dictate who comes out on top. But Trevor, I feel like the eye test, you'd be surprised by it, right? You'd be like, wait, it feels like FBX has been on top. Where did this gold lead come from? Those were the fundamentals that allowed them to stay competitive against SKT in the first game of the semifinal. They are so smart about always playing the side lanes and keeping competitive in CS numbers, which keeps them competitive in gold. And remember, people should not just look at gold because there are other things. Gangplank X extra gold, Pike shares extra gold with the ultimate. Here is a setup though. What's very important is the control of that setup. Vision around Baron. Chain of Corruption tags a target. There's no follow-up. Remember, if G2 pick a fight in the Baron pit against Nautilus, Siva, Gangplank, that's not really a place you want to be. Cannon Barrage is available, and uh, Chain of Corruption was just used. So Gimgoon steps up to the plate, does not find a fight yet. But one of the things we are seeing is FPX need to find an answer. When G2 put pressure down, they are gaining a few more benefits outside of just the Dragons, but it's FPX with control of the Baron Picks. And while these teams are very similar, there are some key differences where G2 have very good burst damage, more for single target. FPX have a lot of AoE that they can try and bring to Brunt. This is what you want to do if you can funnel the enemy team into a smaller corridor where they can actually get more value there. Another difference is the fact that Ryze will just outmatch any opponent in the side lane as the scaling comes up. Another six minutes on the Rod of Ages to complete that. So even with some magic resist incrementally put in, they're going to have to try to force those fights and maybe overforce, as otherwise Wanda will take side lane objectives. Well, at this point, because if you can open up the map, Papa Smithy, one of my favorite strategies that has evolved over the years is the trailing split pusher. And Caps is, a, is on a perfect champion to play that role. 
roll. If you hover behind the split pushing rise and the opponent send two people, you surprise, you go for the burst kill. We have to align on the language. I call it piggyback ganks, where you, you both go. have TP to piggyback over. Let me on! The top lane side, <laughs> here we go. I'm a fan of the piggyback ganks this game. And that's the third dragon secured by FBX. Double clouds is definitely gonna benefit them as they want to continue to move around this map. Caps does get spotted out by an FPX ward, but important to note the synchronized recalls on the side of G2 allows them to regroup uh, up on the map, push back for some control around that Baron pit. And now we're moving into this Baron phase of the game. And for chaotic teamfights, one thing that you should look for as a G2 fan is the fact that we have a Rage Blade build here coming through from Perks. He actually needs to warm up on a minion wave or targets before he actually gets that double hit passive and gets going in a team fight. And this is a sort of game with as many threats as there are that you actually need a certain type of terrain to fight around to get that amount of time. And also, when you are thinking through these possible picks and these possible team fights, you actually have to opt into who is going to burn cooldowns from your opponent. Because there are so many critical ones and squishy members on the team, if you are G2, you're looking at Yankos. He's got the fully completed Zonias and at least also has Repel built in. So while not a tank, you do want the Elise to bait out some of those big cooldowns. If you repel a Nautilus ultimate, yeah. it changes the game for your team. They also have to talk about the positioning of Mickey with the rest. So continually press tab, look for these stopwatches, look for these Zanya's completions, but also the positioning on the members with that stasis. And when it comes to these vision wars where someone puts down their wards, they have to back away and reset the wards and go and buy when the enemy can then take over vision, I actually think FPX will struggle to reclaim vision against a G2 camp, because even the Lantern, control ward down, you're going to be caught going for a face check. And you already mentioned G2 have multiple ways to make them untargetable, like the Repel and like the Tom Kench Deval. Now, there is one thing that is always a huge benefit on the side of FPX, outside of just doing B, setting up a fantastic play. The Proto Belt into the hook, and Mickey gets chunked out. While that's going on, Kim Goon almost picks up a solo kill in the bottom lane. FPX have found themselves a gigantic advantage on two sides of the map. Also important to note, Rapid Fire Cannon picked up a LWX. The 600 CS Civil Win Condition is always a possibility. Quick shot, the reward. Wards for that pick are enormous. Mid tower, the last of the outer defenses going down for G2, make it incredibly more difficult to try and defend in the vision wars around Baron. That was doing be using the proto belt to get into range to try and land the hook onto Mickey. What a big critical play from the star player of FPX. And a 27 minute mid lane turret doesn't sound like a big thing, but Kobe, you're right on the money. Look at this. Siege comp, they've got almost no range on the side of FBX. So they needed a pick like that to ever actually get the turret that's core to Baron defenses, that mid lane out. All right, Kim Goon will now run into Wonder. Both of them level 15. Wonder got the first trade, but doesn't follow up with any more. And outside of just clearing out the vision, FPX weren't able to get more than the tower. It is a huge win for them. Do and be making the move that counts. Yeah, I mean, people have criticized the champion pool for so long. Uh, you know, some people advocates and want to see Do and be on the world stage proving his style. You see proof right there in that play. This is why he plays these types of champions to create openings for his team in this case. Now, FBX have to look to the next step for themselves. They want to use that speed advantage from Sivir Ultimate whenever it is up to enable those two champions to try and find that hook. Caps, by the way, level 13. It's matching at B. Top laners have got most of the experience this game. Wonder is up 80 CS over Gimgoon and still playing that side lane. But we haven't had that huge explosive team fight. It feels like if one team is able to win it, they could either take it in Hib or a Baron and get huge control in this game. And it's getting much more difficult now for G2 to play to their champions. Because FPX have such a good possible team fight here, Sivir, as you mentioned, Quick Shot, extremely good and well protected uh, damage output for that force. Uh, it's going to be very hard for G to actually find that kill onto the back line and remove those AoE crits. And that's the really important point is that in the open, you just can't win as G2's comp. In a 5v5 where everyone opts into it, it's not going to work. But they always have that pick 
quick CC opportunity if they get a vision reset. So actually look down the middle here. Look at the scoreboard. See the control what's put together. Stonebee could be caught. All right. Uh, who's catching who, though? Because I think there's more support for FPX to respond. Perhaps <laughs> escapes from the dredge line. We are 30 minutes into game one of the championship final. And truthfully, we still don't know who's going to come out on top. FPX have got Pryo in the mid lane. They do not have control once they don't want to face check. So again, this awkward setup. All right, here's the potential team fight. Do and be stepping forward. He's gonna take some damage from that volatile spidling with a Banshee's Veil. Wonder feels more confident to step up. A 30-minute Infernal could be very valuable. Dredge line is dodged away from as the Drake is secure, but now G2 are split. That's at least some CC to interrupt. The chain of corruption will start to spread, and it's Mickey that gets tagged. He's locked down, he's knocked up, he's dead! LWX is on a rampage. The Sivir is terrifying. There goes the teleport, the chain! Oh! The king, TM, you beauty! Gets the double kill for FPX. The flash to gap close, but Dombey might die here. He might just indeed. Two more teleports thrown down. Realm Warp's coming out, and they manage to escape. Wandering Caps run for their lives. Three members of G2 Esports are down. Death from below is available for Caps. Can he snipe Do and B? He does! He gets the kill. Ten kills to five. Now it's a two, B, four inside the pit. The G2 solo leaders, all that's left for them to try and defend the Baron. Quick shot. There's a death from below available to Caps. He manages to get the you are one to take so much damage from the barrels. Go straight in, but the ulti does nothing. Baron's been listed to help G2, and finally, Wonder goes down. Kim Goon is low on HP. Eight seconds left before Perk survives, but it's FPX that get the Baron. They will claim their prize of Baron buff to empower the push. All right, Kim Goon, will he find trouble from Caps? Yes, he does. And not gonna go for the kill just yet. Caps now continues to chase. Abyssal Voyage comes in from Mickey, but the Tongue Lash is sidestepped. Kim Goon escapes. 3-0-4 on that gangplank. It started with him, and it may end with him. I just want to highlight how quickly the decisions have to be made after this play. Instantaneous from all teams. Infernal Drake picked up by two. They go into evasive maneuvers, trying to kite down towards the bottom half of the map. But with the Sivir Ultimate and with Nautilus, immense crowd control, they are split apart, Papa. And then it becomes just a buddy story here of trying to allow oh. Perks to escape. The kick to interrupt with the knock up there. Beautifully done. You see the cheering here from backstage. Yeah, Yankos wanted to get in between so that uh, the Q wouldn't land, but you just kick him right through, still gonna get the knock up there. And that led to what we're seeing on screen. Baron up, FBX coming for those inhibitor turrets. It's unbelievable performance from FBX. If you look down the kill scores, 304, 316, 126, 403, of the team's 11 kills, the kill participation is extremely high. It's what we wanted to see from FPX. Push out a lane, roam to a side lane. The difference is it was Gim Goon's gangplank with the cannon barrage that was the recipient of this game. And he sets LWX for another kill. 386 CS on that Sivir. With the Baron buff empowered, the inhibitor turret's going low. But Wonder is rattling across the damage onto FPX, but he's caught out the dredge line into the flay. Wonder's looking for the Realm Wolf, and he won't escape. 603 LWX is dominating. G2 did so much damage, but they couldn't finish it all. FPX are able to get what they came for as well, Quickshot. Inhibitor in the mid lane is down. Will be constant pressure for them to get off. And getting the Baron, which was such a difficult ask for the team comp they had, is the tonic to actually get those 5v5s in open areas where we already outlined early. There's just no response from G2's comp. The moment Caps fishes for a hook, his health bar is deleted. Again, so much of this game has been about finding picks, hitting skill shots, and then using those openings immediately to get more from your opponent. Look how FPX do not hesitate to burn all their cooldowns to look for one more advantage. This is the way that you can snowball one play into the next and to get the most out of it. And you see how low FPX are. Had Caps been alive with Death From Below, in the melee, in the AoE, that ultimate reset could be a game changer, but he was not. So the inhibitor goes down. G2 are 4,400 gold behind, and you can see that gigantic spike from the Dragon Fight to Baron. 
And Papa Smithy, FPX are in complete control of game number one. And I think the one consistent through this topsy-turvy game of action has been that we felt the impact of Doimby's Nautilus above Caps's Pike style pick at the end consistently. You understand the theory behind it, starting boots, going Predator, and having the ability to roam, but never getting the lane control to actually match Doinby, who was three, four times ganking top and bar. And this is Doinby's most iconic champion mm -hmm. for the mid lane because it is so abnormal, because no other mid laners fully embrace it to this style, and everyone has always posed questions and say, okay, but prove it on the world stage. Here you go, Papa Smithy. I submit Exhibit A. And yet, oh, we see the, oh, Bone by Sivir, they want to catch Yankos. They absolutely do. Yankos flashes over the wall. Now look at the minimap. The rest of FPX were setting up for a potential Elder Drake. Perks gets caught by the Nautilus ultimate, and while the cannon minion is still there, G2 Esports concede the Elder. They're going for the in hit, but the Dredge Line tags down Wonder. He's in trouble. Doombi goes golden. Another death sentence comes out. Devour from Mickey buys enough time. Caps, death from below. Kills down Doombi. This is a 5v4, but the HP is low. Chris gets tagged. Caps goes down. It's another one, but look at the damage from Wonder. He's looking for LWX. Glim Goon turns around with a parlay. LWX gets the boomerang, gets the ricochet. The round warp comes out, and G2 escape. Oh, G2 remain on the attack, even while FPX have the upper hand. And in that, they open up the base. And just remember during SKT, they conceded the Barons to get the inhibs. This is a game about pressure and control of the map. And this is why G2 is so beloved. They never go quietly into the night. They will always try to find a counterpunch. They are impossible to KO. Exactly, Papa Smithy. They will always look to surprise you by remaining on the attack on the offensive. And even if FPX close this game, there will still be lingering doubts. Not often the case when you win game one of a World Final. Mickey looks like he's going to get caught out by Gimgoon once again. 4-0-8 on that gangplank. Throws down another stopwatch, and while Caps is arriving to see him go down, that is another kill, another death that is unneeded and unnecessary at this point. FPX strike back again. And guess what? The Baron is soon to arrive. In only 30 seconds, with a Elder Dragon 3 Elemental Drake buff, FPX have full control over hunting. the area. They're hunting indeed. Yankos has got a Banshees. No flash available to him. And on the minimap, we've got no vision. The Observer's building the tension, highlighting what G2 can see. FPX are putting pressure in the top lane. And as what we can see, Quick Shot, they're moving to the bottom side of the map. Again, trying to remain on the attack, even though FPX have more to gain with Baron coming over from that side. They still want to make the offensive play. They rush the minions ahead with the Rise Realm Warp, and they're going to race it. Look at the minimap, though. The rest of FPX, they've peeled onto the Baron. Recalls coming out for doing B. That's a three-man Baron stack. Teleports are coming down. No, that's correction to the top lane. Perks manages to make his way up. So Baron will be conceded here as Wonder concedes the flash to run away. Imgun is chasing. He's got himself the Eye Edge, the Essence Reaver. The Baron is secured. This is the second of the game in conjunction with Elder. FPX should be in control. But G2 don't care about shoot. And I love those conditional languages in a match like this where FBX has been packing the punch or have the scaling. It's still conditional because G2 still gives you questions to answer. And if you're too slow in this meta, you can still lose. Gentlemen, coming into this game, we were discussing how FBX and G2 have redefined how League of Legends is played. And we are already seeing all of the arguments being made. Both of these teams continually shooting their shots, taking their looks. FPX have not buckled under the pressure where a lot of teams get surprised by the constant offensive moves while G2 is down. FPX have remained calm, and this is the key to game number one. Now, with the Baron and the Elder Dragon, they're able to push on top side, and they should be able to get the rest of the rewards. G2, though, throw another counter punch on the bottom half of the map. You can see in the mini map. They get the double TP down bot lane, but what has to shake up on the top side, and can a TP flank undo this three man push? All right, we're going to have to find out. Doombi is able to defend for now. Teleport is coming up. That's the recall now coming up for G2 Esports. The top lane inhibitor is going to fall, and the mid lane inhibitor is exposed as well. FBX have used the teleport form. Doombi, they're going to try and get two inhibitors here. G2 recall. All right, inhib number. 
number one hasn't fallen just yet, but it will in a moment. There it does. Both of them fall down. Caps manages to find the bone skewer, and G2 are looking for an initiation. By the way, Gimgoon did not leave that bottom lane. So two in hips secured in favor of FPX. They still have a minute and a half on Baron. And another three minutes to Elder if G2 can survive. And you're in this awkward spot as G2 where you want to walk up posture and draw a GP teleport. So your piggyback gank down the bot side, your pushing game can actually work. They don't get that TP. Gingun holds on to it. If all TPs are down, there's still a split push scenario for G2. FBX marching ahead here. They have remained calm. They still have a minute and 20 seconds to work with the Baron buff as well. Teleport available for LWX as well as Gimgoon. And it looks like it will be a reset. 40 minutes into the game, and it is a 7,000 gold lead for FPX. LWX sold his boots, is at full Siva build, and 26 CS shy of what is considered the win condition for Siva. 500 equals victory. Now, I should be even more confident than that right now with a minute on Baron. Realbop comes out, and Wanda's going to get caught up in the next sentence. It's another kill. It's another pick. It's another moment where FPX are shining. 60-second death timer, Kobe, with super minions in multiple lanes and Baron to defend. That's probably going to be game number one. Quick shot, FPX with the 5v4 advantage will march on the Nexus turrets. Chain of Corruption is available, and Yankos gets Caught out the devourers buying some time. There goes Caps forward. Chris manages to stay alive. That was a fantastic flash. The King of Corruption is starting to sprint. Chaikos buys some time with the hourglass and doing me goes low. LWX gets another. TN finds a second. The Nexus Tower falls as well. FPX only for one last kill. Not gonna find it just yet. And the Nexus gets focused. The Nexus gets killed after the ace. And FPX strike first in the finals. First Blood, first Dragon, first Baron, first Nexus. And truthfully, it does not play out that easily. Big smiles on the G2 faces, but FPX open the finals with a statement. And I think G2 can actually take from this. They made the enemy fight, and we talked about how they played a dangerous game. They left open all of FPX's classic polling cards, and they knew if they took game one, the draft wins from this would be massive. They're not going to get those draft bucks. They are taken down, but damn if it wasn't a twist and turvy road over 40 minutes. The play on Summoner's Rift was exciting. I'm also equally excited, Papa Smithy, to head into what you're talking about, the draft for game number two, because blue side we talked about being so important for both of these teams because of the nuances here of those specific champions. Oh boy, this is already setting up the way we want it. We had the outplays, the caps escape onto the realm warp, and now we have to just bring ourselves down and regroup for it's game It's so two. hard with the energy and the screams wow. in this arena. <laughs> I feel like I'm attacking the game at all times, and so do FBX, so do G2. Let's also talk about the fact that FBX, I don't want to say surprised us, but they were going top was something that we haven't seen them do a huge amount, and they did it so well, Kobe. And again, that element of surprise has improved for both of these teams throughout the entire tournament. A lot of people dissected G2's game versus SKT as well, and then making a lot of uncharacteristic surprise attacks moves. Uh, FPX do the same thing. <laughs> yeah, they absolutely do, and it, it, it ends up getting them a victory in game number one. So obviously G2 are gonna get side selection, Papa Smithy. This is something we've talked about a lot. Blue yep. Sun has been the preferred side of choice. It's been more victorious multiple times. We will get to talk about yes. it in the next game for more on how game one played out. Let's hear from the State Farm Analyst desk. Thank you very much, Quick Shot. That game one oh. had just about <laughs> everything you could have asked for yep. to kick off a finals best of five, but it's FPX that strikes the first blow. That was, uh, that was wild. We had the outplays. It felt like we were going to go to hyper late game. You didn't really know when you were going to count G2 out. It kept like they were in striking distance, but FBX yeah. just closed the door. That game was tense because both teams were giving so much respect to Fog of War. Like, they were playing actually at a very high level. Yes, there were a few missteps yep. here and there getting caught up, but that's because that was the win condition. G2 never wanted to team fight. They were always trying to spread up. And the way that FPX gave a few minion waves to make sure they could find the fights. Like, it was it was a beautiful game. A few minion waves, sometimes their support as well. And that's <laughs> the thing, if you don't see anything, who do you send in first? Your support, the Thresh, which doesn't add that much late game value anyway. That's why you got caught out a few times. That's what 
we saw from DJ and what they wanted to do, but it wasn't enough because you got, never got rid of the wave clear. Let's take a moment to evaluate champions like Frost. I know during Countdown we talked about, you know, the bait of the Varus Tom Kench to maybe have the G2 response to the pike on the other side. Well, they got all three. Uh, yeah, <laughs> and the, the big question mark here is going to be the pike bait. The casters did a wonderful job talking about it in-game, but that's kind of where I felt everything started. You see a draft like that, and it's pretty clear-cut what G2 are going to do. They're going to roam a lot. They're going to try to beat Doinby at his own game, and specifically in the top lane. Ryze versus Gangplank is a great matchup for Ryze. You have Elise, who is phenomenal at diving, and then you throw a pike on top yeah. of it to have that mixed damage of the AD with the two AP carries, and suddenly G2, for the first 15 minutes, you're like, this is all about blitzing top lane and diving with Pike. And we also get to see the power of the blue side for FBX and why they selected here in game one. There's not enough bans to get rid of everything. If you also want to remove these key target picks we talked about in the pregame, doing these champions, do you ban them away or not? In this case, Kiana, Saya, and Panthen are just power picks you got to get rid of. And so, typical to FPX and what we saw from them in the semifinal, they came in with a plan. And that's what I want to talk yeah. about, the early pathing by Tien to disrupt the game plan formulated by G2. I think Tien and the whole of FPX played this properly. And this is actually another reason why I don't think G2 will go back to the pike as a Nautilus counter. Because the Nautilus gets too much freedom in the early game. So A, they split vertical on this side because they know that they would much rather dive the lane that doesn't have Tom Kench in it. This isn't necessarily about having GP top or needing to get Gim Goon fed. It's just the only thing they had to do, and FPX have been masters at stacking waves and diving. Yeah, it, it basically throws a wrench in G2's plans. FPX yeah. read exactly what they wanted to do. When you split the map like this, G2 can no longer just start throwing everything top lane. And even though they slowed Wonder down, they didn't shut him down. But this then yeah. meant that the next time G2 could strike was waiting on that Tiamat power spike from the pike so they could compete with the wave clear. And that happened 8 minutes 30 seconds into the game. And that's when FPX did slow down a little bit with all these plays towards topside. Wonder did start getting a lot stronger in the game as well. Despite him ending with a 1-6 one, one and six score or something like that, he was still able to push later. But that's why you normally don't attack the Gangplank lane if you have Gangplank on your side. But in this case, it stopped G2 from playing aggressive early. I think that was a beautiful call. And FPX, they love invading with the jungler level one. FPX gonna feel good about that one. And while they got out to a small early advantage, this game was not without those moments for G2 where you saw their comeback potential. And when it comes to performing in front of this epic crowd here in Paris, some players, they try and show up. You know what? I'm just gonna let Quickshot take this one. And I love that you pointed out with the arrow there, because the sort of thing that's lost, because people say, oh, it's a death match. Oh, they're just fighting all the time. But it's the setup and the silence that allows it to happen. And speaking of silence oh, setup. Fantastic setup, Papa Smithy. Teleport comes in. If BX is looking at numbers advantage, Chris will arrive and captures in so much trouble. He's going to get taken out. Oh! The real wolf from Wanda! The moment this realm warp is on, I didn't think Caps could even get in. Yeah, exactly. Because he got slowed down there, even with the mobility oh. of Pike barely flashes to the edge. The margin there of error is so incredibly small. One is screaming, I'm helping, I'm <laughs> helping. Couldn't have said it better myself, quick shot. Sure, I love the hype around the play, but I have to highlight that actually cost G2 so much. Wonder sitting there getting caught out initially by doing B and then the forced TP to try and defend him. That meant for about five minutes, G2 were not able to have Pike roaming in the side lanes. And it just meant that Sivir, who was sitting on one item at that point, got to farm and farm and farm and farm and farm, while G2 could not split up the map due to lacking TP on that Pike. So this actually cost G2 so much and allowed FPX to get to late game. Well, this game was back and forth, both teams having moments of pressure and pushing the aggression, but I do want to take a look at where it all broke in favor of FPX. Let's go through one more fight. And this was right, I believe, at the end of the game after they'd been able to pick Wonder. And when FPX can get this type of situation, they're going to have a good time. And I have to just say, Chris played this game so well, oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. not letting Caps get good pike resets off in team fights. There were actually a few very close moments in this fight, but once they got this push, it was over. Him and Tian, the jungle support, we gave it to FPX coming into this. They showed up big time. I mean, I'm going to add another day. Doinby, I thought his uh, Nautilus play when he was hard for us, when he catches Mickey, he did that blind mm. and he just grabbed him in the bush. He's like, I have a suspicion someone's going to be standing here. This goes to Fun Plus Phoenix game one, that is, but G2 definitely not out of it as they retool in their ready room. But that's going to do it for game one. Fun Plus, they've stuck, or rather struck, the first blow here in the quest for the world title. We'll see what G2 can deliver after this commercial.
commercial break. Gennem spillet og hans karriere har vi skabt en ny relation, som jeg vil værne om altid.